first of all, I love podcasts, okay? But there's one podcast I think it's just terrible, okay? There's no talent. It's called The Establishment Exiles. I don't even know what that means, okay? It's a total ripoff of Chapo Trap House, okay? Pathetic. It's going to be a complete failure, believe me. Ron is a total loser. Kevin and Brittany, they produce more fake news than CNN. Can you believe that? Mike is terrible and nobody watches the humanist report, okay? Elise is a total wacko. She scares me. And let me tell you about Ashley, folks. She's a total fraud. Very sad, okay? Hey guys, how's it going? My name is Kevin Asani. This is Establishment Exiles. I am your one of your hosts. Uh, we have on um, Brittany. Hi. Uh, we also have Ashley on. Ashley, say hello. Okay, and then we also have our special guest host, Anoa. Hello. Good, great to have you on. Thank you very much. On such short notice. Um, so what do you guys, what is going on out there that you guys want to talk about? Um, I know we went over, we, I, I don't know, I know, uh, Brittany was not on last week's show. We talked a lot about the Brazil, Donna Brazil stuff. I don't know if you want to talk about that. If you want to talk about anything else. I, you know, I can't, so I kind of talked to Anoa like briefly yeah. in like one sentence and told, <laughs> <laughs> and told her that I was kind of interested in talking about holding leftists accountable. Right, um, right. And I know that Ashley wants to talk about Alabama because she has some like serious insider home yeah. knowledge about it. Yeah, <laughs> Ash- Ashley, do you mind if we get to that maybe near the end of the show? Yeah, whatever okay. you guys want to do. Great. Really okay. All right. Um, yeah. So for that, I just feel like yeah. we can't be expected to hold anyone else accountable if we're not holding our own people accountable. And there have been some leftists you know, under fire lately, Mm -hmm. I think. And I think the natural inclination is to just kind of brush it off or excuse it away. Yeah. And I think that's the wrong thing to do. Uh, Can you give us an example of exactly what, I forgot what it was, what example you used for? Um, So like we can talk about Sam Chris. Yeah. Why don't you talk about that a little bit? So someone basically um, told the story about something that happened with Sam Chris. Um, I think it was definitely more of the assault harassment type. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people were, you know, kind of quick to defend him. And then he wrote this bullshit non-apology on Medium, and it was this big thing. Mm. But um, I don't know. Noah, do you have any anything to yeah. say about that? So I think it's a really good point, you know, for you to start with where you were saying that we need to hold ourselves accountable internally because there really is a lot of posturing morally about, you know, we have the better platform, we have the better candidates, we have the better this, that, and the other, but there really is behavior that is engaged in that is equally problematic across the board. So example, particularly in this entire conversation that's being had right now about, you know, sexual assault, abuse of power, protecting spaces, and, and the people who occupy them, I really do, I really do think that we do need to take a step back and have some rules of engagement and community standards for how we do things. Um, because there are too many, too many people are beginning to, you know, share their stories and have conversations 
And there are circumstances, even on you know, with progressives or on the left, we do have our own version of like, you know, celebrity or even establishment almost, where those are people who are considered almost untouchable and above um, beyond reproach. And then when something happens that kind of taints our image of them, it like completely rocks our world. And we need to stop being so centered around personality um, so that when something does happen, we're, we're completely unable to deal with it, you know? Um, and, and I just think that we got to start looking at how to build better spaces and how to deal with conflict that will arise because our faves are problematic as well. I mean, people are flawed, they're human, and unfortunately things happen and we have to figure out how to address them. Yeah, I mean, we're we're totally imperfect and we're obviously going to have our flaws. I think we just need to kind of figure out the best way to deal with that without alienating people because it, it kind of puts us in a really awkward position, you know? Yeah. Either way, we're alienating somebody, whether or not be like the, you know, perpetrator or the victim. And you don't ever want a victim blame. Yeah, so. definitely. I, I mean, I, I think, I mean, one of the issues that we, that, Mike, myself, Ashley was on and David Dole was on. And I, you know, I want to talk about how Justice Democrats, they, now this is a very good group, very good progressive group that's, you know, that's run by Jen Huger and um, Kyle Kalinske, both of, you know, TYT essentially. And they had a candidate that they chose, Allison Hartson, that's going to run against Diane Feinstein in California. And there was a guy named uh, David Hildebrand who came out and said that he got he was refused, he was basically turned down from being uh, from being supported by Justice Democrats because he was a man and Allison Hartson is a woman, so they were looking for a woman, and they basically, in his words, created a candidate. They made a candidate and they wanted make, to make sure it was a woman, and he came out and said that's. You know, that's identity politics, the same kind of identity politics that the Democrats, regular Democrats um, play. And that's not something that <clears throat> that, you know, that should be done because that's just, obviously it's just hypocrisy. And I totally agree with that. Now, the, the, the question becomes is, did that come from the top? Did that come from Jank? Did that come from um, Kyle Kalinske? Or was that something that was just, uh, you know, one rogue character? You know, so so what do you so I know what do you think? Do you think that's true and or and, and do you think so, that's a problem? Because I actually have relationships with people who actually make decisions. Kyle is a figurehead. Kyle does not actually make actual decisions, is my understanding, in terms of the day-to-day -day operations and organization. What I will push back on as I push back on the Twitter threads, I disagree that that was bad policy or it's the same identity politics, right? Mm. I think the email itself was problematic. But I think to say that in a race that had, I think it was three men already mm -hmm. running, um, and, and to say that for them to want to seek out not just any woman, the, this, this, is, this, is where the, this, this is where I get annoyed with progressives. We talk about holding people accountable in terms of quote unquote identity politics. It is there to me in my viewpoint, when we look at the lack of representation in Congress as a whole, particularly when we're fighting over a seat, there are so few women in the Senate, I don't see anything wrong in a field that already has several men running for justice Democrats to say they want to run a progressive woman. They didn't just go find any woman off the street. You know, the, 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 and what happened, you know, everyone's acting as if they just grabbed some random woman that has no qualifications, no politics, nothing. So I don't, I disagree that that is wrong. It's the same old, same old. It's not the same neoliberal because they, they'll shove, you know, they'll, they'll shove anyone down our throats and just because they're women, we support, support them. Now, I do know that, um, that that was from what I was told, uh, I spoke with Corbin Trent because Corbin, I'll, I'll tweet. They get a little nervous sometimes when I tweet at them. I'm, <laughs> he was like, oh, do you have any questions? Do you have any concerns? Uh, no, that's not, that wasn't like our, that, that wasn't a policy or anything. I was like, no, you know, I figured because what people don't understand is when brand, I started out when I was a volunteer staffer with brand new Congress in the very first start. That's mm, how yeah, I yeah. Okay. BNC and Justice Democrats have an interesting relationship. So I don't disagree with people who back and demand greater transparency in their decision making. But what people need to understand is it's not that they just created their own candidate. That's what they do. They, they run their own candidate. Right. They run their own. Like if you're going to complain that something is not working for you, I get that the, the gender thing was jarring. And that was a really poorly handled situation with the help. Desk. 
Now, I'm not going to advocate for people to be fired because they don't handle something very well. A lot of folks are brand new to how to communicate with people and things like that. That person just probably shouldn't be do- handling emails and working on the help desk. Right, right, yeah. But at the same time, at the same time, I think people, if they're going to make demands of organizations, you should actually understand how they work, what they're looking for, and what they're doing. So for for candidates that are already existing, they've already launched, they're already running their thing, if you have an organization that is running their own candidates because they run the campaigns and they handle the messaging and the policies, you know, it's possible they might not want to work with you and your already team because they have their own apparatus already set up. Not that there's anything personal, but what 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 really reflected to me in that all that entire exchange was David didn't seem to have an understanding of what Jim, Justice Democrats and brand new Congress, how they're how they operate. Now, some of the pushback I got was, well, they're not very transparent. And I agree with that. And I've mm-hmm. said that, you know, to Corbin and to other people I know who are involved with both orgs and, and they've been working on that. And I think that people do need to push back. But I wholly reject that in this in this progressive space that we can't center, you know, people recognizing that representation matters. We have a lot of white men in politics who hold office in space. I'm not saying that white men necessarily have to sit down and not run for office, but to sit here and say that we should not try to f- seek out and encourage women, women of color in particular, to run for office when there's so few of us in any of these positions at all because it's not fair or it's the same thing to them. It's not the same thing to them. The yeah. Dems will just pick up and grab anybody. They don't care about politics. They don't care about policy. Recognizing that representation is an issue as well as that we need people who are good on the politics that is a winning combination. Yeah. And I think the way it was handled was definitely handled poorly. But I also think that we have to understand with these organizations, they're brand new and people make mistakes when they're responding to folks. From my understanding, that was not necessarily like they sat in the in the conference calls, like we're only doing this here. Yeah, yeah. But like that that got conveyed some way somehow and it was absolutely problematic. So Ashley, I know you and I discussed this off camera before last uh yes last week's show we seem to have a point of conflict here i know you have views that were similar to mine yesterday i've become i've got i've gone a little bit more you know more towards the noah's way what do you think sorry what was the last thing you said you i I've, I've gone a little bit more towards the noah's way i i don't and I, I don't think you said that either i don't think you said that it was a top-down kind of thing either but what is your view on the whole you know, the whole possibility that it could be an identity politics uh, matter. Well, I, I think, it, it, I know, I, I guess I didn't fully consider it. I think, I think, I know, uh, uh, I think she had a good point um, in that, um, in that that person probably shouldn't be the one communicating. Yeah. Um, I, it does seem though, if you're just, I mean, if you're just looking at it from, uh, you know, uh, Hildebrand's perspective or anybody that saw the screenshots of the, uh, exchange like like the rest of us did. If just from looking at it like that, if we want to talk about accountability and um, transparency and all that, um, it does appear kind of along the lines of some of the neoliberal kind of. Yeah. I'm going to pick a woman because she's a woman. Now I'm not. I I, I do I do understand your point, and I I, I am trying to lean towards what people are saying. Um, I'm just saying like if you're looking at the rest of the world. I guess myself included because that's what I saw. Um, it it's easy to point fingers um, at everybody else who's criticizing it, like like uh, like you and I did, Kevin, right. uh, to begin with. Um, I, I do see some of the points you're making, but another point I do have to make about that, um, as far as representation is concerned, I do think that we, in a lot of ways, we are severely lacking in proportional representation in Congress. Um, however. The place I think that, and I mentioned this last time, that we're actually lacking the most um, is bringing on people from a working or poor class background, um, any gender, any race, uh, period. They're actually historically have made up less than 2% uh, of Congress the entire, for I think like 100 years or so. I, I, I have to double check that. But, um, and have made less gains actually than women. Uh, people of color, women of color ov- overall. Um, so I'm all about bringing on, obviously, people of color, women of color. I think we absolutely need that representation. We need proportional representation. Um, but I also think we should start looking at bringing on people that run uh, more grassroots because not necessarily so, but I think they're more likely to be from 
working in poor class, which would have um, what 50 to 60 percent of the country uh, yeah. their their best interests in mind, or you would hope that they would, because yeah. it's interesting because 50 to 60 percent of the country is traditionally working class, um, yet we have less than two percent of them being represented. So that's just kind of my take on it. Okay. Um, I, yeah. Go ahead. No, I so I just feel like Noah's main point is, and I know. Please feel free to jump in and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, is that the difference between Democrats and what's happening with Justice Democrats right now is um, more of a tokenization, right? It seemed like you were saying that Democrats tokenize um, women of color, people of color, and just women in general, as opposed to I'm I'm guessing I haven't really looked into Allison's background enough to know whether or not you know what her qualifications are. But it it seems like you're saying that they're she's actually very qualified and they're not tokenizing her just because they wanted a woman to run doesn't mean that they are only running her because she's a woman, right? Well, well, well. The thing is whether or not she's qualified or uber like like I don't even really know how we get into it because quite honestly I don't know what makes David qualified, right? Besides the fact that he says that he's already been running in the race. And yeah. they should, yeah. no, I'm being, no, I'm being really serious, right? No, that's because a fair he's point. Already, he's already been running, and they should have just picked one of the three progressives already running. You know, Kevin is already endorsed by DFA and and other folks like like you you the, the, to to say when they they're looking at the race. And they're making a strategic, you know, decision on what they're going to do. They decide they're going to get someone who is progressive and a woman yeah. because it's uh, they're running against a woman. They want to hedge their bets and do the best part thing. They looked at the race. Like I said, you already have all these other candidates. And what I also told them, my also my, my pushback though was I was like, okay, I can understand it if you know X, Y, and Z. But I told them I said, you know, Ro Khanna really messes things up for Justice Democrats because every person they have as a Justice Democrat, with the exception of Ro Khanna. Is is a brand new person whose campaign they're helping to run. Roe is already in office, and I'm like, you know, that kind of that kind of looks hanky. You guys need to be really clear on what you're doing. Yeah. But the other thing, in terms of in terms of the economic representation, I mean, there's still that alone still does not address and, and deal with some of the issues that we're having right now. I mean, we have to look at economic. We have, we can't look at class alone. Yes, we need more people who are of working class backgrounds. But quite honestly, when you're getting to someone who is the average person. We have a lot of people running around right now who talk about how they're working class. Well, they might have been, like Elizabeth Warren is a perfect example. She's someone who has a working class background, but she was working class like 40 years ago, right? right? Like like, like, like 40 years ago, what relevance does have? Now, I, I agree about having people who are working class right now, but this is the other reason why you're gonna have campaigns like a Justice Democrats, like a brand new Congress, because you have people like Cori Bush who's running for office and works full time. Corey ran in 2016. Right. She was one of the, the Missouri, um, one of the Ferguson activists that, that endorsed Bernie Sanders. She works full time. So she needs more of an apparatus like a brand new Congress to help her run her campaign because she still has to work. Um, a couple of different people, uh, Kathy Myers works part time. Yeah. Um, so she's working part time. You have several people who are still working. So if you're working class, right, because of what it takes to run for office. So we still if we're going to have, you know, whether even if it's a grassroots campaign, we still have to get more familiar with the way these organizational formations work. What will best help us leverage whatever resources and stuff are available to help candidates who are going to be, you know, from these these areas and communities like uh, Paula Jean Swearingen. I mean, there, there there's a whole. Yeah. long list of people who actually are working class or come from particular backgrounds or who, who have connections to certain communities who can be reflective of those ideas but it really takes a lot of power to be able to have them be competitive now i don't think that we need to sell out on that notion or any of these ideals we have to be able to have quote unquote competitive you know candidates and run these races but we excuse me we have to work smarter and make sure that we're availing ourselves of whatever instruments are available within the means and confines, not what's legally acceptable as we've seen come out of Democrat, the Democratic Party politics, but what fits within the purview of what we say we value and how we're willing to work with people. And I, I think that as we continue to build, um, you know, this this current movement phase is very young, you know, politically. I think as we continue to build and develop, um, We'll flush this stuff out, and like I said, with these with these folks, you know, these are both both BNC and JD both have folks who came off the Bernie campaign, but 
this is also really new and they do need to be pushed. I mean, they're doing good work. They have good candidates, but I, I agree with those folks who said they need to be pushed, you know, but I think that we also need to be strategic with the way we are responding to things and the way we're examining things and figure out, because I really feel like David could have come up a lot stronger had he had he and his campaign, whoever works with him, taken a step back and had a really nicely worded letter. It's not even about getting to respectability politics, it's like laying out your arguments very well. Because what also comes off is you have a bunch of can you have a bunch of people on Twitter going yeah 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 at you, yeah. and you're the person running your social media account is not the same person who's on your help desk normally. So you have two different people who may not even be privy because everyone's like, they don't even know what they're doing. It's like, no, you got to understand how organizations work. You might have a volunteer. You may or may not have a paid staff for doing something. That's mm -hmm. not an excuse, but we just need to understand what's the best way to get the outcome or at least get the response we want. And sometimes Twitter works and sometimes it doesn't. So what, it sounds like we have a, a kind of a large messaging and communication problem on the left then. Like we haven't quite figured out how to best do that for what we want to accomplish. Yeah. Um, you know, as far as Ro Khanna goes, I, I found a, I don't know what this is. It's some sort of like, it's like a mailing, it's like, a, it's like an email or something I received from somebody where I think it was pushed by, who was that guy from? Real progressives, uh, Zach Holler, I think. Zach Holler, he posted something I saw that I found somewhere, and it says no Kana hashtag no Kana. Oh God. And it says, but that it's it's a uh, progressive army, the Young Turks, Justice Dems, brand new Congress, and even our revolution have been pushing Ro Kana really hard, claiming he is not taking money from super PACs or mil or millionaires, but it, that is 100% false. He is one of the wealthiest members of Congress because the millionaire donors to his super PAC. Now, I don't know if that is true. I haven't Here's, had time. Yeah, so. I, no, I have something to say about this. Not necessarily about what Zach is saying, but just about the message that he tries to get across. Because I feel like intentions are really important when you take into account what people are saying. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't think he has good intentions towards the left. When you, you're talking okay. about someone who is kind of moving to the right and working more with people in the alt-right and thinking that's acceptable, I don't think that they're trying to do anything for the left at that point. And that's that's where I think Zach is coming from. Um, I Now I have many more feelings about Zach that right. I don't feel like should be addressed right now, but I yeah. just think no, we don't inten intentions yeah. are really important and I don't think his intentions are about furthering the left. Okay, but, uh, and that's, you know, I, I can see how he's probably, I, again, I haven't looked at the details of um, the things that he's, the links that he's posted here, but, you know, I mean, we, you know, we do have to call out the left, like you said, and, you know. Oh, absolutely. Posted, I don't, yeah. I don't know if anybody's claiming that Ro Khanna yeah. is not like a wealthy person. I just, right. um, and I think a lot of the thing, the, a lot of the information that Zach is probably getting happened, you know, with his campaign which was prior to him like joining the Justice Democrats, right? Right. Yeah, yeah. And um, picking up all of these progressive positions. Now, who knows if he's going to stick with what he says? But so far, I think he's done like a pretty good job of yeah. championing progressive policies. He has. The policies are definitely there. But I guess you know, I saw somebody that say on Twitter somewhere that you know, as progressives, we always follow the money, and. When it comes to certain donations, he's getting this in there, you know, X, Y, and Z, you know, like, oh, so, you know, kind of connect the dots. And this is, you know, certain conclusions that we can reach. So, I, I mean, I heard I heard you chime in, uh, Noah. I don't know if you want to give your take on this or not. but um, So the, the thing to look at to understand, because we've gone through this several times, and this is the same type of, you know, wishy-washy uh, tangential connections that we have right now leading us to Russia hysteria. It's the same stuff that had people attacking National Nurses United for supporting Bernie Sanders, because even though they were formed before, their PAC was formed before the super PAC rules, so they're kind of like grandfathered in the old way, they today would be considered a super PAC based on the amount of money and the way they're formulated. Um, but the problem is there is there was a super PAC that, that supported Ro Khanna uh, in his prior two elections, I believe, when he ran unsuccessfully in 2014, then he ran again in 2016. 
uh, I try to search for statements or comments from him about it, and it is a. Uh, there was one statement I think through the from the last. I can't remember if it was the last election cycle, or the cycle before that. But there are a couple of there are a couple of um, quotes from him, you know, floating around out there about it. That you know he discouraged it. You know he he said you know obviously he has very you know overzealous people who support him. He discouraged it. But what we need to understand about like super PACs, with the exception of what we saw with Correct the Record, which blatantly had yeah. you know interactions with the with Hillary's campaign, super PACs are not permitted by law to interact with campaigns. So if you went, if you had money and you went out there tomorrow and you wanted to form a super PAC for whatever progressives um, that you you liked, um, you could do that, and you know people could tell you to stop but if you want to spend your money you're going to spend your money so i don't know whether that's a really good like excuse you know from him or not i don't really know how i feel about that but i really do think that we need to have an understanding about PACs, about org formations you know under whether it's the irs or fbc designations and and the difference between PACs and also super PACs, right because that's something that a lot of people get confused as well um but 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 the idea that because he takes money from rich people that somehow you know he's a problem He's also representing Silicon Valley, and there's a lot of rich people right. there. Yeah. Like, I don't really know what to say. But, I mean, what I do think, though, is if we are going to have people who are taking pledges, and I don't really – I haven't looked much into seeing if he took any pledges or anything like that. I do think that's something to, to, to look into. And I think what he's referring to – because I will also say, as a co-managing editor of Progressive Army, yeah. we have a lot of different people, including at one point Zach Haller, who yeah. published with us. Um, and a lot of we don't we don't actually all agree. We'll have internal disagreements about things. It'll get published because it's newsworthy and it's coverage. But we don't actually all agree about what gets published. And we do have some folks who have been very, very favorable of Justice Democrats. And, you know, there were some pretty favorable pieces on Ro Khanna. But then you also have people who are very, you know, pro third party, anti dem or, or we have people writing from overseas, just all types of stuff. So I think that it's not an issue of trying to promote or be positive about him. He's someone that seems to be doing the right thing. He seems to be wanting, willing to use his platform to elevate, you know, other candidates, be they, like I said, my, I, 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 I admit I do have a slight bias because I'm Corey and Paula are friends of mine. Like I've known mm -hmm. Paula since 2014 when we had a chemical spill in West Virginia, we became, you know, friends over, you know, po poison water. Uh, when I used to live in West Virginia. So I know both those women very well. So I would love to see them do well, right? Yeah. But at the same time, I do believe that we should be requesting transparency and we should be asking the right questions. But we need to be making sure that we ourselves are informed. And so we might have all these different competing pieces out there because when you, you'll go back and you'll look at, uh, what is it usually? It's like Open Secrets or um, there's a couple of different websites you can look at to see yeah. like where money comes from but when you actually go and look, like, because people talk about, oh, look at the industries, look at the corporate yeah. donations. Those yeah. are individual contributions. So exactly. that's where people yeah. work, right? So if you go and look, you know, I get hit up sometimes for big fun. I'm a lawyer. I get hit up for big fundraisers sometimes because I'm a lawyer. And I'm like, yo, so I'm not that type of lawyer. I don't make that type of lawyer money. Right. Are you sure? But, <laughs> <laughs> I wish I did. You know, I'd be you know, like Ben if I did. But um. But I think that I don't know. I heard Progressive Army was funded by Soros. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm I sure. waited for that right along my reparations check. But um, um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think that we just need to be more. We just need to make sure there's a lot of there's a, so many different voices out here. Like that is one thing that I think is so rich and dynamic, despite how I personally feel about some other folks who occupy this independent media space. There is a rich diversity of voices and information that's being provided. But just like with regular media, just like with, you know, people who may consume right media, like we have to be very tenacious in verifying and vetting our information and, and, and making sure we understand. Because it's very easy for somebody to write it, write something and make logic leaps, as we see right now happening with the Russia hysteria. Yeah. It's very easy to draw conclusions. And if you don't have a background or you don't understand what they're talking about, you're like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. So we need to make sure that we just have the best information possible when we're doing what we're doing. Yeah. Also, because I've been looking through Twitter a little bit, I did see Zach Holler's um, article on progressivearmy.com. dot com. Um, but he, I think there's, I think it's also what's his name? Uh, yeah, real Tim Black. Tim Black's also. I think he's gone. He said some things about Brokana as well. 
not very favorable. I don't know if that's true, but I so I feel like there's definitely a lot of things you could say about Rokana that aren't positive, especially mm -hmm. given his past. Um, but I think we on the left, like on the progressive side of the spectrum, need to kind of just collectively decide um, what kind of answers are we looking for from him and like what would appease us. Yeah. If we asked him all these questions about things that are concerning, you know, what would we accept as an answer? Um, because I don't think that that's something anybody thinks about. I think that people just want to constantly question things. Yeah. And they're not like, okay, well, I accept that as an answer. It's just like, no, you did this once six years ago, and I'm going to have right. this problem yeah. with you forever. You yeah. know, it, we need to, like, figure out how to move on from situations. Yeah, I agree. that Because everybody wants to just use that one, that one, I don't know, misstep or, you know, fuck up and just be like, oh, well, you're, that means you're not a progressive anymore. So, I mean, and that's obviously absurd, and I don't think... Yeah, there's I, a difference between, like, you know crucifying somebody and holding somebody accountable yeah and and i i love a noah's point about about ro connor receiving money from people that are in these specific companies so for example the thing the the little write-up that i read says 94 percent of his as in ro connor's contributions are from outside of his district 99 percent of his contributions are the maximum amount made by wealthy contributions from google investment banks pharma an insurance former ex, uh, Enron execs, blah, blah. So it goes on and on and on. So these could just be people within those. Within I mean, those they're, they're absolutely just people within those. Yeah. I, I don't mean, know the details, but you said, like you said, you're right. You can look, I know you probably all know this too, but yeah. on the Open Secrets, there are, there are um, spaces to check like where it has some um, small contributions, large contributions, tax contributions, it's separate from the industries themselves too. So, um, so for I example, think... for Rokana, it says Chad L L L Lupi, Lupi Nakisi, New York District race $900. Matt Rosendale, I mean, I guess these are people that have either funded him? No. All right, keep talking. I'm sorry, I'm going to keep looking through this. Oh, no, it's okay. I was just actually point up the, the side that we're talking. Um, so just uh, a couple of points. Y'all said a lot of um, really, really important things, I think. So regarding um, Rokana Ro um, and, and then just, you know, other people on the left, progressive left, if you, if you will, I still think that regardless of who he takes money from or who he doesn't or what he's what he does and what he doesn't do i think you know obviously it's important to um to recognize when he or she when they when they do things that are very that align very much with progressive policy with progressive policy progressive ideals yeah. um but i do think it's important um to kind of also to keep that in mind where they do get the money because it doesn't mean that we have to write off everything they do. And I think that's a problem that we have not just with progressives, but with pretty much everybody. Um, you know, we, 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 we look at the money that they get and then we automatically write everything yeah. off. I mean, I'm guilty of it too. Yeah. Um, I guess what I'm saying is, so like Zach Art Haller's article, for instance, and his other articles. So, um, you know, kind of he, he wrote to be wary of Rokana. And, um, you know, he writes about being wary of other people as well. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm kind of somebody who, who, who tries to listen to all the progressive voices, even the ones that are a little bit farther to, if you want to call left or right, however you want to look yeah. at it. Um, because I just feel like I don't really believe in throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. I think we all have important contributions, even if we agree on disagree on some things or we anger each other like i know there was that whole tim black um was it tim black zach Holler, yeah, caitlin black. johnstone i hear you're talking about like the whole caitlin johnstone thing that happened this summer i also remember right. tim black going at it with jordan Sheraton, i believe it was yeah and i see H. H. goodman of, yeah all that stuff so. right and i see the kind of thing happen a lot and admittedly though i think some of the uh journalist podcasters if you will hmm. are a little much for me personally. I do yeah. still listen to them and I do still read their pieces because 
there are still important things they have to say. And I just check, I just check the sources. I just checked, I just verify yeah. what they say because I think it's important. I still think they do have important things to contribute. So it doesn't mean that I'm, um, and I think that's the problem too. We, yeah. We're really quick to, um, well, no pun intended, exile. Yeah. <laughs> Well, even in uh, yeah. within our own group, if if they don't meet certain criteria or if they kind of fall off the wagon, so to speak, right. um, and I I kind of feel like unless somebody does something really egregious, we should really try to work with them at least on the things that we know we agree on because we're not as strong as we could be or should be as yeah. progressive um, in a lot of ways, and that's because we're fighting not only the the Democratic establishment but you know, also the Republicans. So we're, we're literally fighting two pretty powerful groups. Um, so I just, yeah. so I just think things like considering, you know, like when you read things like Ro Khanna's contributions to other people, I think it's important mm -hmm. to all keep that all in mind. It's like you all said, holding people accountable. Um, it doesn't mean you have to write off things that they do or say because they do take contributions, but I do think it's important to consider it. I don't think we should get hung up on this kind of idolatry that people tend to do. I think we're all guilty of it. I mean, I, I was as well for a little while of Sanders, not so much anymore. I, I, I don't do this anymore. I'm, I'm about policy. You know, I'm not about, you know, uh, just the, like I said, the idols of people. Um, yeah. But I, I think, I think as progressives, it's important that we keep all that in mind and, and um, keep each other accountable that way too. I actually want to talk a little bit about 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 Bernie Sanders and some of his positions that are that should be called out a little bit more. I think his position on Palestine Israel is very very murky, and I don't know why. I mean, I honestly don't know why. I think he probably gets a lot of he probably gets a lot of pressure from the establishment to be a little bit more pro Israel, just because that's kind of the cool thing to do. I guess, but he doesn't have the worst view on the on the issue. But he is definitely very kind. Of like he doesn't want to support BDS and stuff. And I talked about that on my own show today. And I think that's one of the main issues that needs to be called out regarding Sanders. And I think some people are a little afraid to do it. I think, I mean, I know I know Kyle Kalinske definitely does it. I think Jank Uger has done it a couple times. Those are the two main guys I watch. I don't. I no. I feel like everybody who like really believes in you know left policy will call bernie out on yeah. his problematic stances i don't think i mean you have obviously his fans who are just like bernie 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 but i think yeah. for the most part the people who actually believe in the issues um who aren't caught up in the idolatry that ashley is talking about you know will say no bernie is definitely problematic on this like he's really good on these things but his position sucks on this. Like, I don't agree with that. Um, and anybody who is not able to do that is definitely stuck in that, you know, phase that we just all need to get out of. Like, it, it needs to stop being about personalities. It needs yeah, to be about no, policies. Totally. Yeah, and definitely. Because if it's not about policies, then we're just going to start talking about, like, well, he's not wagging his finger right. And he's not, <laughs> you know, his voice is too loud and shit. I know. Do you have any, anything to say about then? Any, anything regarding Bernie? And... I think, I think, I think you guys have, you know, this, I like the way this thematically has been evolving this conversation, right? Starting off with, you know, how to hold leftists accountable. And now we're here at Bernie mm -hmm. and Bernie is like the leftist right now, right? A lot <laughs> of people actually would argue he's not very, he's not even really that left. He's anymore. in the center. Yeah. yeah. He's left the yeah. center, but he's not, he's center left. He's not really that left. There was a piece yeah. out, I forget where it was written at, uh, I think it might have been Son of Baldwin. Bernie Sanders is not really a progressive or something like that. I haven't read it yet. But I do agree in terms of being able to hold him accountable. It's weird, right? You do have those who have like completely gotten off the Bernie wagon and they have no problem like, you know, giving him the what for. But then there really still is that more, uh, and I, I can't, I got to find a better word for it, that more establishment progressive lane that is still very much wedded to his image and to his brand to help you know further the work that they're doing so you do have people who will still look at him very positively and are very reluctant to uh, criticize him or critique what he does and when he says prime example it was the whole you know um heath thing you know the whole uh uh, uh you know we can run pro-choice uh pro-life candidates type of thing right. and you know the, you're supposed to be like the most feminist man and you know the most pro-choice most progressive most radical 
you know, and, and a lot of people took that as a as a as a backlash, as a as a slap in the face almost. And and there are those I think your point though about his his position on Palestine is really good too. He gave that really great speech at APAC during the election last mm -hmm. year. Um, well, actually, he refused to go to APAC, and they refused to to hear from him. Um, mm -hmm. But he gave that really great speech, and it was like the most cutting edge thing that had ever happened in the history of you know mainstream candidates making statements about Palestine. And then this year, he signs on to that unanimous letter from yeah. that Marco Rubio wrote, right? So he's like, well, I wouldn't have worded it that way, but I signed it anyway. But hey, why aren't we talking about Saudi Arabia? Like, the, Bernie's problematic, but Bernie's problematic because Bernie is a politician and like, they're all, people are flawed, right? And I don't think that we can't be so focused on not criticizing Bernie when he does make a misstep that we're so worried about the Hillbots or yeah. Hillary supporters or whatever terminology people are using these days. We can't be so worried that they're gonna pick up on that as, as weakness because really the critique and the self-evaluation, it actually makes us stronger because they can't do it at all. No. Like they, they they can't do it. We've already seen how they fell apart on Donna Brazil. And I know you guys already yeah, talked about yeah, it, yeah. but they can't they can't do it and it makes us stronger. And no, that and that's that's my whole point. We have to hold our own accountable. Otherwise, you know, like what the fuck are we doing? We're not doing anything. We don't stand for anything if we're not holding our people accountable for the things that they're doing wrong. People do things wrong all the fucking time. Like they need to be called out for it. And if you can't call someone out for doing something wrong, are they really on your side in the first place? You know, um, it's, it's something that I think needs to happen and it doesn't happen as often as it should because I think so many people on the left are, they have that same fear as people in the center. Like we can't, we can't criticize our people because like the Republicans are there. No, it needs to fucking happen. Like, yeah, uh, you know, one, I just speaking on my, from, you know, my own personal experience, I voted for Obama twice. I'm sure all of us did. Um, it, it's amazing where the conversation has gone because when he was, you know, he became president in 2008, we were like, oh, he's such a great guy, hope and change, first black president, that's great, that's wonderful. But then all of a sudden, slowly but surely, he started to become this corporate, this corporate puppet. And still to this day, I still see his loyalists coming out there and saying, well, I mean, he's better than Trump. He was better <laughs> than Bush. I mean, and he's, I, he was, you know, he's the bl first black president. Come on. I mean. These Obama I, fans, they, they like are insane. I don't know. I mean, people wax nostalgic for Obama. They're like, oh, I miss Obama. He I, Oh my God! And then when they do that for Bush, I just can't. I oh love the Bush one, yeah. What was that you know, about? Those those people don't care. Those people don't care about any any of the issues. They only care about decorum. So what what is it? Are they educate? Are they uneducated on the issues, no. or are they just no? They just don't care. It doesn't affect I, them, so they well, don't care. Yeah. I I think yeah yeah I think Brittany um I think you make a you good point. Um, however, I, I think there's some other things to it as well. Um, I won't name any names, but I have friends that are pretty well educated. But to be yeah. honest, some of them literally only listen to pundits and yeah. believe what specific uh, mainstream media and news sources say. And if they say it, then it has to be the truth. And it kind of is crazy to me because they're pretty educated people. And, yeah. <laughs> but that's, I mean... And I used to be like that too. I used to always go defend Obama. Now I defended Obama against the right wingers, but these days I'm just so like I don't even I was because I posted on my my own Facebook page about how, you know, I know people criticize me about how I go after Hillary Clinton a lot because people do, and that's just on my Facebook page alone. And I have a lot more people that are anti Hillary coming on. I'm sorry, anti um, Bernie that are coming on that page of mine and, and criticizing me. And you know, I, I say like, listen. Attacking Trump is really easy. I can easily go out there and say that guy, you know, he's a fascist, he's a this, he's a sexist, he's a racist. Like, you can do that, but that's low hanging fruit. That's yeah. Trump is a very easy target. That's somebody that you can go out, you can criticize, and it's just so easy. But going after people like Hillary Clinton, going after people on the left, those are the people that we can actually convince, maybe, possibly. I know it's not easy, but it, those are the people that we can kind of have that kind of dialogue with where we can call them out, but we can also be like, listen, do you want Medicare for all or do you want to have some shitty Obamacare that, 
you know, that is not even, that's still keeping how many, 20 million people uninjured? Uh, so, 30. I, I, I just, I feel like the broader conversation that the center is having, which is a valid point, is that yes, Hillary Clinton, like, was definitely preferable to what's happening now. There are a lot of Democrats that are, you know, moderately preferable to Republicans. I don't, I don't know that there could be any kind of discussion to be had about that. I think that's like factually true. Yes. However, if, if that's all you're focusing on, you're never going to get down to the things that actually matter. Like if you're only trying to be moderately better than Republicans, which is how I feel Democrats have been operating for like the past eight or so years, you know, you, you kind of end in the situation that we were in, in 2016, where Donald Trump fucking won yeah. because you have so many people suffering under Democrats that Democrats just don't give a fuck about because they were only trying to be moderately better than Republicans. So it's it's really important to hold Democrats accountable. And, you know, like you said earlier, everybody's holding Trump accountable. Everybody. Who who is holding the left accountable? It has to be us. Um, it has to be us. Yeah, it's not going to be the right wing. The right wing is not going to hold anything accountable. All they're going to do is talk about Seth Rich, and they're going to talk about how the DNC rigged the primary, but they're not doing it from the scenario, or they're not doing it from the perspective of, oh, we really actually care about having fair primaries. They, they don't care right. about that kind of shit. So, right. Anoa, um, I think we've uh, filibustered a little bit too much if you want to jump in here. Oh, no, no, you guys are good. It's, it's nice to listen to other people talk for a day. <laughs> I run my mouth so much. Okay. But no, but but I, I agree exactly with what you guys are saying and how this conversation is going in terms of, and again, like I said, the way you guys have weaved that theme through about, you know, holding it accountable and even, you know, the internal accountability and respect in this, in this dialogue is really good and what we need to model more of. And I say that as someone who can be a Twitter thug sometimes. So, um, yeah. you know, I do know that we... I mean, but we do, we do like, like the whole thing with Obama and the hope and change is, I think the part, I think what we have learned though since then is that we got to stop, not just listen to how great someone sounds or how, you know, we feel right. Cause our emotions can trick us sometimes, but I think we, we, we really learned, particularly in this, this recent election cycle, the importance of informing ourselves about the issues and the candidates positions and digging in deep on what that meant. I mean, because I know there's a lot of people now, you know, who are a part of this grassroots growing progressive movement who talk way more about things like TPP and, you know, environmental justice concerns and all types of at a level of sophistication that most people probably never imagined discussing. And we got to find a way to help make that, ex that information accessible and easy to understand for more people. And that's how we continue to grow our numbers. But 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 just thinking, I was like, yeah, you know, I thought you were getting ready to make a joke when you were like, well, I voted for Obama twice, but, and I would have voted for him for a third time. <laughs> but <laughs> I would have, I, know that. I definitely would have. I mean, I mean, to the point, so I always, so I was never one of those people, like, even though I admit, I did not vote for Hillary Clinton, but I also live in Georgia, right? And mm. like the South was going red. I voted for Jill Stein only because I have a bunch of people who were like, no, 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 come on. You know, you can help us get to that 5%. And I was just, and I'm all, I'm very critical. I actually got a lot of flack for being critical towards the Green Party. And I was like, all right, you know what? I'm going to do you a solid. I'm going to give you my vote. Let's see what you do. And they didn't, they didn't do anything with it. But thankfully, I wasn't someplace. But I, I had always maintained that if I had lived in a, in a, a swing know, state, a yeah. swing state, that I would, I probably would have been final hour holding my nose like several of my girlfriends you know i mean hashtag girl i guess guess i'm with her was a thing not because people were excited like one of my best friends from law school we would go back and forth all the time and she would just she was like so aggravated she was so aggravated she's in pennsylvania she was so aggravated she's so angry she's like i cannot believe we're here again like you know we we recalled not voting for her in 2007 2008 cycle because we didn't like her because she was racist it didn't matter how how qualified she was she ran a bad campaign and here she was again she just wouldn't go away i and know so, uh, <laughs> this goes this so goes against the narrative that i keep hearing like black people love Hillary Clinton. Yeah. No, we don't. What we is just, the deal? Just, Please, no, no I tell we me. don't love. We don't love. We don't. I'll be the black friend tonight. Wait. We don't love Hillary. Clinton. <laughs> what is this deal? Okay, ninety-four percent of black women voted for Hillary Clinton. Is no, this no, no, the people who voted. 
That's what they're saying. Like ninety four percent of the people like, who voted. It's like sixty. Per, it's like approximately sixty percent. I think of, of eligible voters voted. Yeah. I think it's about. I think it's sixty percent. I think it, I think that's what it was. I think the number was sixty percent of eligible black voters voted. Ninety four percent of the black women who voted voted for Hillary Clinton. Oh, so yeah, yeah that's, it's really that's, important. That's like a math. That's that, that's a that's a word problem. That's a math. Problem. But what is the deal? So you have those who are in their positions of dim power or whatever. You know, like you have different people. You have your Donna Brazil types, right? Yeah. Who believe in the party. They 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 have their positions or whatever. But the thing is, like, people got to understand, we are, like, what, 25 years now of Clinton dominance and control within the Democratic Party, right? Like, they were even, there was a hashtag, like, last week, you know, uh, Clinton 25. Like, you know, Bill Clinton became president 25 years ago, and the groundwork was being led, led, laid for that Clinton machine 25, 26 years ago. So you have, you know, that whole level of influence. They were, you know, they refer to Hillary as having the platinum Rolodex. So they have all this money and power and influence. And what they did strategically, they invested in a lot of different people in their races. And they just so happened to invest in a lot of, you know, black people, a lot of people of color to help, you know, get people along. But of course, there's, you never get something for nothing. I mean, in return, you, you're, you're, you're developing, you're building your machine, you're building your base, you're building a collective of people who basically owe you their careers, right? Yeah. So when you, even when you look at South Carolina, real quickly, when you look at South Carolina, because Hillary Clinton ran such a racist campaign by the time 2008 was closing, right? Yeah, it was yeah. it was so surprising that she was able to garner the level of support that she did. However, part of that had to do with them laying the groundwork several years. When she's like, oh, I just decided I was going to run. It took them years to rehabilitate those relationships and to donate and invest money, which they did in places like South Carolina, to make sure that they had that support. They had people who had a stake in her winning. Um, so when we talk about the average black person does not is not in love with Hillary Clinton. The, the those who <laughs> voted for her, it was because Donald Trump really was yeah awful. Like that's just what it was. But you had you had big drops in the black vote in places like Florida and Ohio, which, you know, people might try to blame. But Working America did a study that came out, I think, uh, either in late September or early October mm -hmm. that talked that looked at working class black voters. We always talk about working class white voters. We never talk about working class black voters. Guess what? They all say the same thing. The economy mm -hmm. mattered to them. So we should just talk to work because going back to. To Ashley's point earlier, we need to be holding up, you know, the viewpoints of working class people, right? Like they they said the same. You, you you know, I was like, this is the first time I've really read a survey that said working class black voters, but I'm reading it and they were talking about how the economy and not really feeling like they got any farther ahead over the recovery period and not thinking that Donald Trump would do any worse than Hillary Clinton. So they of those that did not vote, they just did not feel and they did not feel moved. They didn't feel like they had anything at stake. And when you think about the last several elections in places like Florida and Ohio, those are very long lines that people have had to wait in and, and deal with in terms of work. You know, Ohio, we've had a secretary of state in Ohio that has restricted access to, to the ballot like we've seen in North Carolina, Wisconsin, across the South, et cetera. So, I mean, it's a lot at work, but people don't, there, there are the acolytes of all shades and colors yeah. and ages who love her for whatever their reasons are. But the average person isn't in love with her. The average person, you know, if anything, you know, they tried to get Obama to pull that whole, if you, if you believe in me, then you'll go vote for her. That upset mm. a lot of regular rank and file people. It's like, how dare you? <laughs> um, wait, uh, wait, no. Are you telling me that sixty-five million people that Peter Dow said would love <laughs> Barrett aren't aren't into that? What I'm <laughs> saying is Peter Dow. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, you know. Peter Dow is so, a fucking idiot. I, okay, I said, no, I, I have. A, I do have one last question regarding this issue before we go to um, Ashley and the whole Alabama races and stuff. I just want to ask you or actually bring up the fact that a lot of the black movement, black Panthers, black liberation, socialism, this was all happening under the, under the, the movement of the black, of black people. This was Malcolm X. It was in some, in, in some parts, Martin Luther King, you know, these were people that believed in true progressive and let's straight, even say progressive and even maybe even in some cases Marxism. And they they were fighting against the system, right? So this attack against you know oh, Russia, Russia, and all this McCarthyite stuff, you know, and and attack like 
I don't know if you've seen it too, but I've seen a lot of African Americans out there saying mm-hmm. that you know you you socialists, you, you communists are so terrible, and you know you capitalism rocks. And you know, like I don't know if you've seen that, but I mean it's getting a really really weird among the black community how they are going up. They're going against that message. What of what I thought at some point was actually more socialist and communist, and if you, you know in the black community. Well, I think there is twofold, right? I think one, you know, like with any other, like with other communities, like I think with black, like the, the term of black community, it's a microcosm of American society as a whole, right? And right now we really do have this, this, this almost this presence of like controlled opposition and, you know, this, this red scare that's happening, right? Trying to convince everyone that anything yeah. that's not the American dream, that's out of the ordinary is a bad thing. Even during that time, as my parents remind me, it actually wasn't, you know, just like I think there's a there's a couple of articles that talk about how the civil rights movement really wasn't as popular. It's popular to us in hindsight, but at the mm-hmm. time it really wasn't either. You know, Dr. King was actually um, that's one of the things that the FBI tried to use against him, the fact that he was influenced by communists and things like that yeah. to kind of taint his his opinion. So I think as Americans are just ignorant on as to communism and socialism. So in general, have the average you know person, yeah. whether they be black or whatever. Right. But I do think what's really interesting that is happening is that we also have these handpicked, chosen voices, right, that exist, whether they're in media or they're mm-hmm. Twitter celebrities, Deray. Um, but like wherever they are, that 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 help shape narratives and taint opportunities to have further discourse, right, in terms of what alternative economics looks like. And so I really do appreciate folks like Wendy Muse and, and you know, who has yeah. a left POC podcast, pocket POC, like, like who people who are out there, you know, Zoe, there's so many wonderful black leftists who are like, we got to bring real. those people on here. We got to yeah, bring you definitely do. Like they're for real yeah. black leftists. You know, I just play okay. one on, on my podcast, but no, I'm just joking. But <laughs> I'm joking. You know, um, I but but seriously though, like there are so many really great people who help understand. I think what we look at though, the second part I want to say is like when we look at that era that was such a rich era organizational wise, you know, right. black American Indian, you had the American Indian, what's it called with um uh uh, uh the American Indian uh Native Americans. It's AIM. The American Indian Movement was was found in 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 sixty eight. So like sixty eight is 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 a popping year because you had the founding of so many different. I mean that late sixties period, but sixty eight is, is, had so many the founding of so many different organizations and and movements. But at the same time, you know you you had um, the Brown Berets. I mean you you, you had such a richer, but the, you you also saw the decimation of that leadership right during that time period. So whatever whatever you know growth was happening whatever leaders i mean some people were end up either in jail dead or on the run Mm. so to be able to develop you know that next generation to kind of take the torch you have it a little bit but i think that what we see right now in the space that we're in is a resurgence and a rebuilding of what we that that 50-year gap that time that we lost um being able to really build you know counter movements uh, uh, consistently across the board. I mean, I'm not going to say that this is brand new and there there has been some development always, but I really do think that we're seeing a synergy that we haven't seen really since the sixties, but um, we need to, we just, we just need to, we need to get back to the basics of just talking to people, community building and grassroots organizing and, and starting not, not have our, you know, Marxist reading groups, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. but, but, but find a way, not that that's bad, but find a way to make these uh, this this information accessible to communities because people might not have understood that the Black Panthers had a communist you know framing, yeah. but they understood free free breakfast for their kids, right? right. They understood they they un- people understand the policies and programs. They may not understand the rhetoric, and so we got to figure out how to make it all work to to reach people. The but, rhetoric, um, I think the rhetoric scares people. That's why they yeah exactly. You know, you know, they they gonna sign off those people. They're like, no, who cares? They're like, they're blacks. They're talking about communism. They must be crazy, basically. Like that's their mentality. Oops, I think she went mute for some reason. No, no, no. Yeah, I just yeah. I just muted myself. But yeah. no, no, no. Agree. <laughs> and I think, but but that's but that's what we're seeing right now, right? Especially with this Russian scare. How yeah. you know you it's t- they're they're. I wrote a piece that uh, got published in the nation just talking about how we need to be careful how we're framing and discussing right. this conversation, that there needs to be nuance because you're unfortunately, you know, people are getting pushback. It's like, oh my God, you corroborated 
um, you co you collaborated with Russians, and it's like, no, I just I just ran a self defense class, or I just went on a radio station. I mean, that's the big thing right now, though. The biggest thing really is the attack on RT, which I've never been on, but yeah. I, I, yeah. I contribute to two Sputnik shows regular. I'm a regular contributor to Loud and Clear with Brian Becker and John Kariaku, and um, also uh, By Any Means Necessary with Eugene Pergier, and like yes, it's Sputnik, but both both shows are completely independently shaped and run by their hosts, and they're valuable, you know, air venues of information and discussion. I mean, I had a dope uh, debate with this dude from the Heritage Foundation about the Trump's voter fraud commission, which you won't find anything like that. Hmm. Not just because I'm a master debater, but also yeah. because the mainstream, you know, MSM yeah. is only going to criticize Trump to the extent Ugh. that it gets their ratings not to anything that's factually significant. And I think that this whole focus on Russia and, you know, Abby Martin has some brilliant takedowns yeah. over the weekend over this, but we really need to find a way to, 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 to continue to sh share our voices to push back on these narratives that are very, very closed minded and, and manipulating a lot. Cause I'm, 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 I'm actually concerned. I'm concerned that we'll see a, a for real and uh, return to the COINTELPRO type days um, with the way things are going and the way voices are being silenced right now. Well, obviously, Anoa is very in. She was one of the people that was influenced by the Russians. She's one of the black people. That I'm was, a black that was, Russian. Yeah, what's up with that? What are you doing? Why are you I'm letting the Russians Russian. influence you? <laughs> All right. Well, well you know, I come by it honestly. My daddy was a Panther, so. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Anyway, sorry uh, that dragged a little bit long, but that's that, that was a great discussion we had. Um, I do not want to uh forego my promise to to ashley to have that conversation about alabama um and no thank you so much oh yeah go go for it uh ashley it's the floor is yours if you want to whatever you want to uh, talk about regarding that whole thing I could talk about some things is there any specific questions you have first before i start so the out? race is the tomorrow between doug jones and roy moore right is that correct it's, uh, December, December 12th. Oh, it's in December. Oh, okay. Unless they they've keep changed talk. it, which, they by keep the way, talking they're... about it. Yeah, they keep talking about it. Right, it's apparently. Okay. They have talked about right. changing the date recently. I don't know if they can actually do that. I believe it's... Right. Yeah, so obviously, yeah. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about, so just go ahead and talk about uh, the, the <laughs> Oh, Alabama. no, no. Totally fine. Um, well, I'll just start talking, and feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. Um. Okay, so as you know, uh, and I'm sorry if I look to the side a couple of times, I wrote down a couple of quick notes, so I'd remember a couple numbers. Hmm. Um, so as you know, Jones had just pulled ahead in the polls. I think it's like 46 to 42 right now. Uh, so okay. Jones is leading. And then there's um, a third candidate, McBride. I don't really know much about him. I looked him up, but he seems honestly kind of just as establishment as the rest of them. He has like oh. 2%. But anyway... Uh, yeah, so I don't know. I have, I have, I have a lot, I have a lot of things to say. I'm trying to figure out the best way to go about it. So in my opinion, I, I don't know how much this is actually going to affect, affect the race. If anything in my, and this is just, I think what I'm saying actually is not substantiated at all, probably by the polls, but, um, my personal opinion, I kind of see this as people are going to, I think, I think what's going to happen is I think a lot of people are going to stay home now. Not that a lot mm. of people would come out to begin with, but I think what it is, is that because admittedly, there's not a lot of people that really like Doug Jones either. Um, yeah, he, he, you know, no one's come out and made allegations against him about, you know, uh, pedophilia or any like um, right. sexual assault or harassment. Um, but he's pretty kind of milk toasty. It looks like uh, Tim Kaine. He reminds me of Tim Kaine. And I could be wrong about this. Uh, so you might want to check me, but I'm pretty yeah. sure Tim Kaine has kind of been alongside him as he's done some fundraising. I don't know. You, you Please Maybe. check me on that. <laughs> I don't know. I'll check but, it out. Yeah. Um, but anyway, um, so I don't know. So right now, Jones keeps running these ads that are just, they really don't say anything. Like I said, they're very platitude ridden. They're just kind of say, we're going to, I work across the aisle. Uh, you know, I'm, we're going to fix health care. But by the way, he's not for Medicare for all. So of whatever. Course he's not. Of course. Yeah. Who's surprised yeah, about that? Surprised that? that? No, he's not for Medicare for all. Like he's probably, in my opinion, he seems more against it than other. Yeah. That's just my take on it. Um, he actually came out with this ad recently. I can't remember exactly what it said, but it was, it 
reminded me, and I think of a, a lot of other people, it really rubbed us the wrong way of uh, kind of Trump's uh, it's both sides kind of thing, referring to um, uh, Antifa and white nationalists, um, because he was talking about um, the Civil War. And I, I don't remember the exact context, but basically what he said was, or, or at least strongly implied, was that good men died on both sides, the Confederacy and the Union. And while there may have been some, you know, innocent intentions there, it was not it was not taken that way by a lot of people. People were looking at it like, wait a minute, why are you giving the Confederacy a pass? You're just trying to appeal to these middle, even to the right, like center, like right of center um, Republicans that you, you you think are gonna vote for more, which is really kind of gross in my opinion, but whatever, it is what it is. I'm not supposed to be saying bad things about Jones right now, but fuck No, 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 we have to hold people accountable on our side. Yeah. Yes, exactly. But I say that because I guarantee you that a lot of people where I live, if they watch this, they're going to be really pissed because right now we're not allowed you can to call let them be out. pissed. Who gives a fuck? It's now, never the I've right time. It. It's never the right time. Right. I, I've done it so many times on these local um, activist groups we have in Facebook, like Indivisible and some other ones, um, and as have a few other people. And we just hellfire rains down on us. Like we are just it's Alabama. What do you mean? Out. I mean, people don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear anything that's all of Jones because right now we have to focus on him winning. That's 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 the sentiment. And it to me, I'm just reminded so much of of, of 2016. Yeah. Now, I, I'm not saying Jones is any Clinton. Yeah, obviously, but, that's the thing. Yeah. But I'm just reminded so much of the same types of attitudes that guys yeah, that we're not allowed mentality, to criticize. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, it, and, and by the way, I don't know if you know this, but Jones was actually appointed by Bill Clinton in the 90s yeah. as uh, the um, uh, U.S. attorney for, I believe, the Northern District of Alabama. So he has worked somewhat closely, in my, I believe, with the Clintons. So there is that. Uh, yeah. Anyway, I have. But he has, he, uh, Tim Kaine has, has campaigned for him. He's going out there and saying, Oh, it's a very winnable race, and you know, okay, it's exactly, yeah. exactly the kind of candidate we need. And uh, Biden said the same thing. Biden that? came and said the same thing. He was yeah. he, that's when he made that comment. I believe that's when he made the comment about, "Oh, I know Bernie doesn't like me saying this." <laughs> yeah, right. Patriotic, and I was yeah. like, "Are you kidding me? Oh my God, I can't even, I can't do this right now." Uh, but I'm just honestly like. Obviously, Roy Moore is gross. Okay, like yeah. he just whatever. Like there's, he, he it's it's clear what he is. Okay, like obviously I I don't know if the allegations will be yeah. proven. I don't know if you can do that. He looks like but, a fucking creep for that. So but I don't the thing know. is, he right. But but the thing is too is that he also I just read um I haven't verified this, but I just read that I think back in the eighties he was banned from a mall like in Gadsden, Alabama, for apparently. I, I don't know how exposing else himself rolling for teenagers <laughs> when he is there a term for his, that I don't, I don't really know if there's a hold on let me term, look that. but that's I, crazy though that's the best that's how i interpret it and so the way basically that, yeah no the way that uh -huh. i feel about that is like one instance could be an outlier Wait. but more than one is definitely a pattern and admittedly, here's the thing. So okay, I'm sorry. Let me just before you go on. It says, "Gadsden locals say Morris predatory behavior at mall restaurants not a secret." So apparently, a lot of people know about him going around and like fucking hitting on young chicks at the malls and shit. I mean, it's kind of not surprising to me. To be <laughs> honest. It's it's not like obviously I said I can't prove things, but it's just not surprising yeah. to me. Uh, it, it, but here's the thing. So, admittedly, when it came out, because honestly, I, I really am not a fan of Doug Jones, and I really think he's a lie. I'm not gonna anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, I admittedly, when it first came out, for a brief second, I was kind of like, the timing is really odd here. Like, I was a yeah. little suspicious, you know. Um, but. I still think the timing's odd, but at the same time, like you said, Brittany, there's been multiple people come out 
Um, and also with allegations from the 80s. I mean, and also he just seems like a gross kind of guy. I kind of feel like it definitely makes sense yeah. that he would, you know, uh, that he would do this. So yeah, I, I, I definitely, I definitely think that, I definitely think that he did do those things. But in any case, um, uh, what else was I going to say? You said you wanted so, to bring a, you said you knew somebody, a lawyer uh, from the state of Alabama. You said he just watched our show. Yes, you, uh, yeah. I won't say his name right now, only because I messaged him get, trying to get permission for to use his name, and I didn't hear back. Okay. So if he gives me permission, I will see it next time. Uh, okay. But I don't want to because he is a lawyer and okay. he does hold a position no worries, here. No uh, but yeah, he is. Um, in my opinion, he's one of the few highly progressive people here. Um, I have seen him for months now before I actually had any interaction with him, just kind of calling people the fuck out in these groups that are just all over Jones and then not trying to mm -hmm. criticize him. And, and he, he, a lot of times he does it by himself. He's all by himself doing it, even against people that I actually have some respect for. Um, so I give him a lot of credit for that. But anyway, um, so I, he kind of started messaging, uh, messaging me with his political 0.02 uh, after the whole podcast launched. And um, so I did, he did share some things I, I thought were interesting. Now, granted, this is um, coming from him. This is not something that's been reported anywhere. Uh, but he did say something interesting, which I actually do kind of believe this. Um, it seems as though people have been trying to get more out for a long time. And um, I honestly, I don't think they give a fuck about his sexual deviancy, whatever the hell you right. want to call it. <laughs> but like, I don't think they care about that, to be honest. I think what it is, I think what it is, is um, apparently uh, the way I understand it, what, what, what this Alabama lawyer has shared with me uh, is his apparently economic um, stance. He's apparently an economic populist and nobody fucking likes that on the left or the right. If you're in the if you're the establishment like you may agree on some just you know ridiculous social issues like yeah. banning gay marriage in alabama because that's what he tried to do uh, multiple times i was actually involved in one of the protests against him for that but that's neither here nor there yeah uh but no nobody in alabama is on the left or right is going to want to deal with an economic populist um so from the way i understand it they've been trying to get him out back when he was chief justice, possibly hmm. before then. Um, so in any case, I economically, it's very possible that Moore and Jones could be very, sim very much on the same plane. I obviously can't say that for certain because I'm not neither yeah. of their heads. And it's very also very possible that Moore will just play to his base. Yeah. So even if he is an economic populist, it's very possible that he will just vote with the party just to keep getting elected. Um, but I did find it really interesting when I heard that, that really they've been trying to push him out, not because he's a scumbag, uh, a disgusting scumbag who yeah. uh, is anti-gay marriage and uh, kind of ped ped a pedophile, but because apparently he seems to be an economic populist. Um, and I just thought that was really interesting. And especially... Especially now... Using in like a Trump, Trump, I guess he's using kind of like a Trump... Trump. Trump. Yeah, uh, I mean, honestly, thing, thing. in my opinion, Roy Moore is kind of Alabama's Trump, even though yeah. Trump yeah. didn't endorse him. Trump endorsed okay. uh, okay. Luther Strange. Um, oh, because, right, yeah. That's true. Right, because Moore knows how to play the crowds. I mean, I know you've seen him holding that, like he held the gun on stage, oh, right? Yeah. Uh, he may or may not actually do that or believe that's right. I don't know. But what I'm saying is he kind of knows how to play to his, he knows how to play to his people, right? Um, and... I don't know. Like, I, I think he just says outrageous things. I think he does outrageous things. And I think it gets him attention. And if anything, we, the left, Doug Jones, should be taking a fucking hint and remembering 2016 because Alabama is just like, like a, like a, 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 I'm saying a microcosm, yeah. uh, uh, basically, of what happened in 2016, except it's in Alabama. Like, I very much feel like, because Jones is very left, very corporate, very establishment. Yes. He, uh, you know, prosecuted the the people who did who bombed the churches in Birmingham, the church in Birmingham. Well, who anybody um, would do that though? You you would have to be an idiot not to do that. So. Yeah, and so he, I will give him credit yeah, for that. Yeah. Like I'm not trying to, 
not trying to not give him credit for that. You know, like I, that, that's, a, that's a really amazing thing he did. Yeah. But that's something he did. And I'm concerned, as are others, about things that he plans to do. Like, just mm. because he did that doesn't mean he's going to do things that benefit right. the, the same type of people, yeah. you know? And uh, honestly, I see... I see Roy Moore honestly is not that much different than than, than Sessions, who was in the seat before yeah. Strange. I mean, yeah, maybe he is different economically, but like I said, it, my guess is he'll probably just vote with his no. base. The only thing is, he says really outrageous things like Trump because he can't keep his fucking mouth shut. That's such right? a crazy thing for you to say. You, you don't think he's that much different from Sessions? That's that like puts a whole different spin on things. Mm. So, so to be okay. So, I think the only difference really is that. He, he's like trump he just doesn't have a filter like he just kind of says shit yeah. because like he, he 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 um tells it like it is as as became yeah. the popular trump phrase and i think people will really gravitate towards that but i think in a lot of ways he's probably pretty similar to i like i said economically from what i've been told he actually is very different but i still think he probably will play to his base regardless but overall i think he's going to vote pretty much almost exactly like the his predecessor uh his predecessors Okay. Um, I don't think there's going to be that much of a difference because his really um, fringe ideas of basically banning gay marriage um, and um, what else? Probably anti-immigration and all that stuff too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, and like I said, he's even kind of on the fringe for a Republican, but those even like really fringe ideas, like the the ones that are even like fringe for even very right wing Republicans. I don't think he's going to get any support for that in the in the Senate because yeah. I mean honestly I feel like people are going to try to distance themselves from him even the ones that probably agree with him. Yeah, Mitch McConnell <laughs> wants him to, to to step down and not even run. And, That's what I'm know, saying. I mean, McConnell is a fuckhead, so you know what I mean. It's like obviously, <laughs> what I'm saying they're already trying to distance themselves from him. Like I feel like he's not going to be able to do honestly. I feel like he would have now. This is in no way advocating for more because disgusting uh but i feel like he's not gonna be able to do as much damage in the senate as he did as chief justice which as chief justice multiple times he uh he ignored uh the federal orders to to uh um he went and he told all the different municipalities that they basically to not marry uh homosexual couples okay. uh, like i said it was the protest and yeah. he 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 disobeyed the order multiple times from the federal level and they told him that he couldn't do that right so he also got famous for basically saying fuck you to the man which is kind of what people why a lot of people love trump if we're being real yeah so, yeah that's that's true <sighs> i mean i'm just saying he's he's a populist one way or the other even if it's because he sounds fake populist. He, he it's said, fake populist it's not real populism it yeah it, whether it's fake or whether it, like you're right it very well could be fake populism but that's it's not irrelevant people, though. yeah it's irrelevant it's still it still uh reaches out to people it's still right. you know it gets in people's minds and then like oh okay well he sounds different you know he doesn't sound like the usual so, establishment type go ahead i know i will right. say that i live in mississippi Yep. which is right next to Alabama. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't <laughs> I don't hear much about Doug Jones at all on the news, but I did hear actually about Roy Roy uh, Moore. Is that his name? I've been drinking. I'm not yes. sure. <laughs> I've been drinking all day. <laughs> yeah, um there was a whole segment about him tonight though on the local news in Mississippi okay. about Roy Moore and um apparently like one of his latest victims came forward. Yeah, yeah. Second or third, I think. Uh, yeah. 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 So, it, you know, it's kind of like making, it's permeating to the neighboring states, I think. Yeah. Um, so hopefully that makes a difference. And again, this says nothing about Doug Jones, but it definitely says something about, yeah. you know, the Republican way more. So. Yeah, definitely. Right. Right. And that's where I kind of jump back to just the kind of the, you know, you know, well, an analogy of like to the, the 2016 election because i i still would not put jones in the camp that i put clinton in because he hasn't had a he hasn't had a chance to fuck shit up that much yet but, of course not but he's a still he's still an establishment type yes he's still an establishment so, democrat well, yeah that's that's the whole point yeah it's kind of the same idea yeah. though people see him still as they see any other democrat because yeah. if you're a republican and especially a deep south republican yeah you see everyone 
on the left as the same, even if they are very centrist <laughs> establishment dem and, or a very far left, like green, like, you know what I mean? You see everyone the same. So they're, they, they don't care. You well, know, I mean, let's uh, put aside the fact that Alabama's right wing in this country, obviously three more, almost three more million people voted for Hillary Clinton, but very, very, very reluctantly. Get, imagine how bad, I know you know how bad it is in Alabama. It's even worse for Alabama and for Doug Jones. You know, so even less people are going to want to vote for him and for Doug Jones. I guarantee you a lot of people in Alabama didn't want to vote for Hillary Clinton either. So it just... Uh, in the primaries, unfortunately, she did exceedingly yeah, well. Yeah, in the primaries. because yeah, well, That's because was... that represents the Democrats in Alabama. And which I think are, it's, it's are heavily, nearly bla I think it's heavily as black as vote, as I'm guessing, uh, uh, in Alabama. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking and, and not just necessarily a black vote. They kind of, the middle-aged sort of right. uh, church-going... Right, right, right. um, that's kind of the demographic. That, she always caters that, to but that. Yeah. She would cater to that. Career. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, and, okay. So I just want to like kind of follow this up too with, so the thing with, with Jones is, you know, I think he's going to necessarily do a lot more damage than his pre the predecessors if he were to win, no. but I don't oh. really think he's going to help. He he's going to be stagnant. He's going to be a stagnant figure who's just going to be like, all right, yeah, I want everything. But, I mean, well. this this is the kind of parallel between Hillary and Trump, though, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's similar, not exactly, yeah. but yeah, I, I would I would look at it. But the people to Alabama Republicans, it's it's exactly the same. No, uh, to Alabama Republicans, it's like he's he's going to be like the next communist takeover, essentially. I mean, that's how sad it is. I just Alabama. like I never I never understand this comparison to like moderate Democrats. Democrats, which are like '80s Republicans, to it's not that surprising. Like, it doesn't make any sense. It's not that surprising because they're, they're they don't know they don't know their their anything to the left of like I don't know Tea Party. Tea Party is essentially <laughs> like oh my god you're like you might be a socialist you might be a Democrat you know and yeah. they don't know the Democrat establishment types hate yeah. us they hate Bernie Sanders they think they love Bernie Sanders. So even though they screwed, yeah. So even though they screwed right. them over, they still think they don't they really know much about all the infighting on the left. They do, but they, they do, but they think that it's like it's almost like a game. They think it's like, oh, it's okay. They really deep down, they like they really believe in the same stuff. I have people come on my page. They're like, oh, Bernie Sanders, the stuff that he believes in, Democrats really secretly believe in, and they secretly want to instill some sort of socialist state. Dude, oh, we, are, we already have I a social wish. state. They already have a social. We already have a social state in this country. We have cops. We have firefighters. We have, you know, roads that are built by the government. That's socialism. What is that? We have I, post offices. Come on. I wish Democrats secretly. Yeah. Right. Believed in Bernie Sanders' that's, policies. That's if only. If you're out there, Alabama Republicans or centrists, <laughs> know this. That is not. That is not the case at all. <laughs> um, all right, guys. So we're gonna have to wrap up. It has been very fun. Um, thank you very much to Noah for coming on our show. Um, I just want to. Hey, speaking of that, I so I apologize, but should, should we we didn't give our chance to give her her um her. Uh, it's okay. I'm gonna actually give it right now. I know Brittany probably oh, knows a I'm lot sorry. of it too, but I can give it right now too. Um, her podcast is um on. Let's see. It is on podcastrevolution.org uh, slash the way with Noah. Her YouTube is youtube.com slash the way with Noah. Her blog is the way with Noah.com. So you can check all those out. And on, she also writes for Progressive Army. Uh, so thank you very much for Noah for coming on our show. Brittany, thank you very much for being on. I just want to say one more thing about Noah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Because I love her so much. She's yeah. one of my favorite people ever. She's also a member of IPM. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Okay. Great. Yeah. It's not. It's not a commonly known fact, but she. Yes, she is a member of IPM. Um, okay. But yes, so you can. She is, you can follow IPM. So IPM underscore tweets. That's the where they're. They're doing most of their work. I, yeah, I wasn't saying that to plug IPM. No, it's fine. You can. <laughs> you can plug it. You can plug it. It's fine. Like, she is a member of IPM. Um, no, Anoa is great. Um, and if if you're looking for any kind of. Um, nuanced discussion on intersectionality or you know race you can always email her she's super open to talking i didn't know she was that, a lawyer she's crazy she, she's yeah too. that's interesting and she's so she's so open to discussing issues that people are just really curious about or they don't know about or they're ignorant to so 
I just I want to say that about Anoa because I think she's such an amazing person. Right. But she's even like when I was really new to the progressive cause and like not understanding race issues, mm. I think I e I emailed her once and she emailed me back right away. Good. Okay. Great. Yeah. All right. So yeah, thank you for Anoa coming on, Brittany. Thank you. Do you want to plug anything? Do you want to plug your your Twitter or anything like that? Um. Yeah. You can follow me at Blue Purple Rain for as long as Twitter lets me be there until they <laughs> suspend right. me. Okay. <laughs> All right, that's great. Ashley, how about you? Uh, really quickly, can you spell out the acronym you used a minute ago, Brittany, for those of us who do not know? Oh, okay. So IPM is the Institute for Progressive Memetics. Um, yeah, I feel like we can talk about that in depth at another time. But it's this thing on the left. You know, we make memes, basically. <laughs> right. I, think Lump I think Lumpy Louise is always doing memes for you guys, which is hilarious. Yeah, I'm... I'm Yes, yeah, she's like one of our main people. I'm also, okay. I'm technically the head of public relations for IBM. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It, it doesn't mean as much as <laughs> No, I know. I got you. No, but that's good. Um, I, I love what you guys do, so that's always great work. Um, and Ashley, yours, your your Twitter is NAH8705, I think? ANH8705, the okay. um, least creative one of the group. Right. Like 10 years. <laughs> Ago, so uh, maybe not. <laughs> okay. how, you can change it, you know. So if you want to, Wait, can you actually change it? yeah, uh, no, yeah, you, you can, can change it. Yeah, okay. yeah, of course. That's so just we might see you with a different username at some point. So all maybe. right, yeah, all right. Thank you very much, guys. And um, this has been the Establishment Exiles. I am Kevin Asani. You can follow me on YouTube on Twitter, uh, twittercom slash blacksmith You can follow me on YouTube dot com slash prog blacksmith and on facebook dot com slash prog blacksmith and this has been a great show thank you everybody and we will see you next week bye 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 thanks